morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to introduce you to Professor Dr. Irving Habib Christian Heidegger, the next speaker. Uh, Professor Heidegger studied in genetic sciences and surveying at the universities of Hanover, Sydney, and Munich. He graduated from the Technical University of Munich in 1986. Uh, from 1991 to 94, he led uh, the research group Digital Photogrammetry at the same university. In October 1998, he was appointed head of the Institute of Photogrammetry and Geoinformation, Leibniz University, Hanover, Germany, where he currently leads a group of about 25 researchers, most of them funded through grants from national and international science organizations and from industry. Uh, from 1909 to 11, he served as Dean of, uh, of the Faculty of Civil Engineering and Geodetic Science. In 1912, he was on sabbatical leave for six months at the IGN Mattis Laboratory in Paris. His professional interests comprise all aspects of digital photogrammetry, uh, remote sensing, image understanding, and their connections to GIS and computer vision. His two areas of special expertise are automatic sensor orientation and object extraction from images. Please, Professor Heidke. Good morning. Um, as a newcomer to your group, I feel deeply honored to be here today. I've never been offered the possibility to talk after Thomas, of course, which uh, is a particular challenge. But before we get into the Topics and the details. I'd like to thank the organisers, Raoul, Gilson, Claudia, Herman, and the team for doing all this because uh, so far it's been a great experience and I'm sure it will be for the next two days. Image analysis for topographic mapping. When I listened to your talk, Thomas, I brought a few of these slides. It could have been mine, and you'll see that some of them are very similar. But then, as you, as, as you pointed out, starting from common ground, there is different conclusions at some points, and there is different timelines at some points. And uh, we'll, we'll see what that means. So I'll be talking about image analysis for topographic mapping, probably not only for topographic. I'll give you some trends in photogrammetry and remote sensing to warm you up kind of thing. And I'll be certainly a lot more technical or mathematically minded uh, than, than, than Thomas was. So that's where the compliment is, I'd say. Uh, in, in the examples, in what I call image analysis, where of course the great thing is going to be saying. Anyway, um, I'll have some conclusions and I'll have what I call the cost scripture. And, uh, I think it was Margaret Maiden who told me if you give a keynote, you've got to provide thought, food for thought. And the way to do that is to make people discuss, to make people think. And the way to do that is to be provocative. So, but that'll be until the last. Some trends in programming and remote sensing. Uh, there is, of course, some in uh, data acquisition, there is some in data processing. That's repetitive, we all know that. And, and so I'd rather put these together. If you look at the sensors, well, there's better sensors than before, there's new sensors, and there's combinations of sensors. And all of that is related to imaging, of course, to some, uh, in some way, uh, what we're using. I'm not going to discuss all of these with better resolution, so finer, finer, smaller pixels from space. We have uh, Nadir and Dublique, so different geometries which need to be fused. Time comes in it, and uh, a lot of these things, are, I can go over it rather quickly because it, it, it is a bit of a repetition of what said, right? 3D cameras, full way from lasers, we heard about laser scanning yesterday, I'm not going to really go into that today. And the all-in-one, of course, your smartphone is a sensor we, we can use, not only for imaging, but also for geospatial day acquisition in love. Non-conventional platform is another one which I haven't heard here, but of course, um, well, MOA was, was uh, mentioned yesterday. Um, that's important, because while we get all this new data, and, and this community knows very well, uh, it's what I call dumb data. Well, nobody wants pixels, um, and so we have to do something about it. Uh, I, I actually still am in sabbatical at IGM, which is why I brought you an image from Paris. 
you know the new Pleiad sensor. This is one of the first one, and it's actually BBC London who, and this is exactly quoted, naturellement. That's what the French gave as one of their first images. It had to be centered in Paris. It's nice. Anyway, since we're working, we're looking forward to getting these images on an operational basis. Nadia and Oblique, these have been around for a while and they of course offer additional um, capabilities, options to do all kinds of analysis. Um, laser scanning, uh, as I say, we heard about those yesterday, full waveform, multiple eco echoes, vegetation analysis, and all the rest. Mobile mapping, something which uh, is increasingly important. Of course, you don't really get the whole areas that the street furniture, the street views, the, the, the road uh, environments is, is what you can do, what you can map there. And, and of course, uh, that leads the way into very, very rapid data. And uh, I mentioned that already. We all have these data sensors now, and many of them voluntarily or non-voluntary make use of, 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 of uh, data acquisition by simply acquiring GPS tracks. Sensor what was mentioned, yes, it's around. Yes, once, once you connect all these things together, you create another dimension of what you can do uh, in terms of big brothers watching you, but also, of course, in terms of scalability, in terms of, in terms of distributed computing, in terms of being able to monitor the world in real time. So, lots of data. What do you do with that? Well, you press. And here's a few key points as, as to what we are doing. Yes, we are collecting data, but more and more we are actually monitoring. I mentioned that a minute ago. So there's much more of a focus on, on change detection, on updating of existing databases, and of course on, on, on prediction. Think about global change. We don't want to know what happened yesterday. We want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. Full 3D, real time. Well, sometimes it's good to have, sometimes it's necessary. As soon as you equip a car with, with cameras and want to do autonomous driving, obstacle avoid, avoidance, of course, needs to be in real time. I mentioned distributed processing already. Crowdsourcing is linked to many people collecting data and turning around the role between those collecting and those using geospatial information. Um, automation turns out to be a sheer necessity. With all these terabytes, petabytes, or whatever of, of, of pixels, there's just no way you can, you can analyze the images uh, interactively. And there's another, uh, another option there, and that's uh, turning towards the uh, consumer market. Well, we are in the visual world. Every, everything where there is images, you can do image processing, image analysis, and I'll come to those t uh, terminology in a, in a minute. And there is, of course, a lot of areas out there, other than the ones we're usually working in, which make use of image, and a few are just mentioned. So change monitoring, just a few examples, uh, demonstrating somewhat the importance of that. Now that is not real time, there are 50 years in between, but if you were living on that island, you'd be concerned about that change. Um, this is another one, rather well known. Uh, glacier retreatment, that happens to be in Greenland, but that just illustrates that changes are taking place and topographic mapping is fine, but knowing what changes may be more important. Same here, Bay of Naples, this is INSAR, technology being used to monitor these changes, uh, and that's only a few millimeters per year, but it can just be those few millimeters too much. Um, you can use change if you turn it around and model change, you can use it to your advantage. Uh, for instance, in um, analyzing multiple images taken over a vegetation period and then trying to work out what the crop was. And more importantly, of course, whether it's the right crop, whether it's the right amount of crop, whether you need to do any fertilization, any, any, uh, uh, well, any type of process. Uh, so that, that's a project we have been running. And then multi-temporal um, processing can also be used by, simply to, uh, to increase the status of, 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 of what, uh, what you're seeing, right? 
that's just an example of if you do, if you do that's a radar image. Um, if you classify that just one image, results are basically useless. Whereas if you take three or four, uh, your classification accuracy goes up. So change is important and can be used. Uh, I mentioned that imaging goes into other areas as well. Um, we're in Brazil here. We're two years away from a major competition. Two years after another major competition. Um, basically, if the goal, if, if the referee had real-time capabilities, he may have come to other conclusions. And uh, one of the issues I'd like to point out here is that I, I mentioned that at the very beginning. I'm not always in agreement with the timelines, and, and so that's that, that's been the case for many years already. And, and so have others. And this slide here may only say anything to German, um, to the German community. This is Germany versus England. And uh, no, the English don't score a goal here. And this is Germany versus England. And no, the English don't score a goal here. Uh, I'll leave it to the discussion if you want to know more about soccer and my, my other hobbies. Anyway, coming back to the status of topographic mapping. This is about how I see them, and that concludes kind of the, the introduction to this talk. Everything is done, everything is fine, automatically, except the actual feature collection, except what you really want to do. Namely, you take the images in order to document uh, the, the scene you're, you're taking the image of, or in order to monitor change. So that's where the second last line, manual feature extraction. So that's where the challenge is. Um, and it's called image analysis. Image analysis. What is that? Now, there are a number of typical questions you can ask when you have an image and you want to analyze that. And this is one word of those. Which building is that? Happens to be the building where the German Society for the Grand Room but Tensing was founded 100 years ago. Well, it doesn't matter, but that's, that's the question. How many people live here? Needs quite some analysis in addition to the pixels, right? Um, where are the buildings? How high are they? How many flats are there? How many square meters per person? Or how many persons per square meter? Similar to the tent example we heard earlier. Typification? Do I need a run? Well, no chance. Um, Connection between text and images? Or just search, say, on the web, oh, which really is matching. So tasks in image analysis then deal with identification, with localization, typification, recognition of data, all, all that of course is part of image, image analysis. Okay. Why do we do that? Well, it's the what, why, how slide, what we just described in a, a second ago. We do that because, well, image analysis is the main reason to acquire it in the first place. As I said, you want to document the scene or you want to document, you, you want to document the change, you want to survey the, uh, the area. Uh, nobody's interested in the geometry as such. And that's probably more a slide towards my programmatory colleagues who get excited about image orientation uh, and, and then forget that something needs to come after this. The last part, however, is important. And it, it, of course, if you want to interpret an image, if you want to analyze an image, you need to know what you're looking for. There was a discussion about the objects there a minute ago. Of course you need a model of what you want to recognize. If you have never seen a car, there was no way whatsoever that you'll recognize a car in an image. And we all know these, these, these quizzes where um, a little object at a totally different scale is being shown to you, like a little match at the size, and, and, and nobody knows that it's just a, just a match out of a match box. So yes, in order to do image analysis, you need to worry about models. You need to worry about what you were actually trying to infer. You need to worry about more things, such as if you have complete, competing um, interpretation strategies, you've got to somehow resolve the conflict. So quality and statistics comes in there from the very beginning. And we talked about automation as well. And, uh, okay. So image analysis, and this is a definition of 1982, 
by Oswald Rosenfeld, who is one of the pioneers of that area. And he says, image analysis is the automatic generation of an explicit, meaningful description of physical objects in the real world from images. Okay? So you have the real world, you take images, and the description is what you want to have. The description, of course, it says meaningful description. It means, well, somebody else has to be able to do something with that description. So therefore, meaningful means meaningful with respect to the application. Okay? And as I said a minute ago, there is no way you're going to do any type of image analysis without uh, being concerned about the model of the real world. And that, of course, comprises all these objects, their relations, their context, etc., etc. 1982. And that's one of those slides uh, I could have uh, borrowed from Thomas as well. One of the ways you can come up with this object model or model knowledge in image analysis is, of course, uh, while well, thinking about the fact that, yes, from the images, it's GIS objects we want to infer. There is models for GIS objects. It's called, called a, a GIS feature catalog. And, and I'll just contrast it um, what you usually find in the GIS catalog, the feature catalog, versus what you need in image analysis. And yes, there is a large overlap. And yes, there are some parts aside, right? Uh, shadows is just one example of something you would typically not have in the feature catalog of your GIS. If you are faced with the problem that shadows and other disturb uh, disturbances, like cars on the road, just uh, happen to, to be uh, visible in the image. So yes, there is a, a, a very close link between images and, and what you want to take out of the images, put it in the database. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a, and this is the technical part of things, uh, a, a flavor of the underlying algorithms. I happen to think that if you want to do image analysis, you really need to worry about these. Otherwise, you never know the, the limitations of what you're actually doing. So yes, you need to, to look in there. Um, and again, some of these are, are similar to what we've seen. Here's the semantic network. Uh, that is work. Um, uh, about 15 years ago, uh, back in Munich, um, spearheaded by Hamlet Meyer uh, in the group of Heinrich Ebner, in the programmatory group of TU Munich. A semantic network describing road networks. Um, I'm not going to go through the details here, but suffice it to say that, of course, there are different scales. A road is different in different scales, and there are different layers. There is the, what some people call ontologic layer. Here it's called the real world. Sometimes it's called semantic model. There's the geometry and material. That's where the physics come in, the reflection. <coughs> and then there is the image. Now, there's many ways to structure such um, information, such knowledge about objects. This way here, which goes back to semantic networks, um, research by Neumann and colleagues in the 80s and 90s, this structure here has the beauty of, if you change an image, such as you have a radar image rather than an optical one, you only change the lower layer, right? Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of set up in a, in a way that is more blessed. Results of what we came up with are about uh, in, in this order, um, and, and, and here I don't go into the algorithms, but yes, of course, it's line extraction and edge extraction and parallelism and it's the information of what you just saw in the semantic network uh, transformed into a set of image pro processing algorithms. Another one is about segmentation. Um, we all know about segmentation. We all know it's never good enough. Now, what can you do about it? One of the re recent ones is, is called normalized cuts. And it, it happens to be rather good. And therefore, then, I'll, I'll just give you some idea of of, of how it works. Um, now, first, the motivation basically says you, you simple segmentation algorithms are no good for complex scenes, and we all know. So, normalized caps, um, it, it has a few distinct flavors. First of all, it, it borrows graph theory. And second, 
it combines local information with global information because conceptually there's a link between each pixel of the image to each other pixel. On operational terms, you may cut this down to some kind of neighborhood, um, but from the, from the ideas, each pixel is connected to each other one, and therefore you have the, uh, the possibility to introduce not only local information, edges between the pixels, but also global information. And what you would then do, and there's an optimization which is kind of involved, you're trying to, now I have to see whether it does work, well, it doesn't matter. Um, you're trying to cut that graph once you have contributed, well, the pixels are the nodes, and the edges are the similarity measures. And you want to cut at the position where it hurts least, right? So you, you have to have some criteria and say, this is a weak edge, because there is a lot of dissimilarity between two pixels. And another one is a very strong edge, because it's very similar, these two pixels are, according to some criteria. And then you have to find a cap where you only cap the weak edges. The way it's done, um, this is where, um, where the actual cut then comes in. The way it's done is, is a lot of math, and I'm going to spare you that math. Suffice it to say, that if you really want to know what's going on, this is what you need to study. And, and you'll find there that there is integer computations going on. So uh, there, there is the indicator vector of x and y, which are either 1 or minus 1, which means they either belong to one segment or they belong to another one. There, there is nothing in between. There, there is no derivatives. You can only be pro or con. Now, you have to relax some of these constraints and come up with approximate solutions. These mathematics are involved, uh, but that's a good way of capturing local and global knowledge and coming from the structure of the image. In other words, you have individual pixels and, and, and there is no analytical, no continuous mathematics. And another beauty of, of uh, normalized cuts is that it's a, it's a very elegant way to combine different criteria for segmentation. The one we've used here is, is all we've used that for our extraction. Um, and, and, and they're listed, it's the edge intensity between pixels, it's the color, uh, the U difference, and the NDVI. That's, of course, coding of what we know about the objects, right? Namely, the roads we're up. Um, some more work needs to go into there before you come up to results like these. This is urban areas, this is road extraction in urban areas, and what you can see is, well, the results are the yellow lines, as you'd expect. Um, where you see yellow bright lines, you just expect to, to also see roads. On the other hand, it's not very complete. Not, not at this point, right? Uh, it is about the state of the art, at least the one I'm aware of, what you can do in road extraction in urban areas. Two conclusions. One is, Roads may look different in different parts, and I invite you to uh, listen to Marcel Seen's discussion later on today when he's going to talk about what you do if you fuse multiple road models, because some in open areas and in urban areas, for instance, roads just do look different. Another one is road crossings. Um, if you think of roads, long elongated objects or, or um, Areas with um, uh, with basically constant gray values, road crossings are, are different, and therefore then it's no wonder, no wonder that your road crossings need to be um, need to be separate. We'll come back to that. Um, I'll introduce snakes. Many of you may have heard about that concept. The concept of snakes again is interesting because. There's local information and global information which is combined. And in doing so, you can basically, starting with um, a rough approximation, uh, what you see here, um, you, can, you can basically weigh the information of the image, which is, of course, the, the contrast between the black and white that you're seeing there, and the um, characteristics of the curve by formulating what's called the internal energy, some continuity. You want this curve to be straight. If it needs to be curved, curvature shouldn't be all that large. 
So you have constraints, not minimize the um, and you can come out with, with results. Again, subjective contour, of course, some other people may come up with other results. You can put that into mathematics, this time it is analog mathematics. Um, it boils down to um, solving the integral at the lower part, where you can see it's the sum of what's called the image energy and the internal energy. So the information from the image telling you there is a, an edge at that point, the black and white contour, which you just saw. And, and the internal energy, which is basically capturing the, the snake itself. So the curve, uh, which you see um, in the upper part, uh, represented, well, parameterized as uh, uh, with S, the, the arc length, as a perimeter. Uh, Euler Lagrange equations and calculus of variation is what you want to use here. Again, something I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, because I, I'm not sure you're really interested in that. Suffice it to say that this is what, uh, what, what needs to be solved. And in order to understand exactly what's going on, uh, somebody needs to look at these mathematics, of course. Um, another example, closer to what, what we would normally do, is um, the extraction of these boundaries. Say you have a, um, some kind of approximation, maybe from a, a rough segmentation, and uh, this is Matthias Boutenhoek's work, uh, who extended snakes to also capture topology, uh, to connect that to, to GI science, if you like. And, and, and as you can see, these snakes slowly, slowly uh, move to the right place. And, uh, it's a way then to refine um, the information uh, shown, shown in blue in a minute ago. Okay? And uh, yeah, finally, of course, that's, uh, that's it. That was. Now these snakes can also be used, let's look back at the road crossing a minute, um, I, I showed you a minute ago, they can also be used in a, in a bit of a different fashion, of course, to capture, oops, what's going on here? Somebody needs to click into the center of that image. See whether it works? Yes, it does. Um, of course, to, to capture the, um, the road crossing, and you can see things Moving things are always nice to look at. Um, it's what you call ziplock zip snakes here. And of course, once you have the road, say from the algorithm I showed you earlier, the road crossings, once identified, can be captured using such techniques. I think this is the last, um, the last example, the last algorithm, conditional random fields and graphical models. Uh, we use that for multi-temporal uh, and multi-scale interpretation. So, you, of course, if you have images from different epochs, they may look different, and the task here is to basically classify the image. Um, we heard about rules, and that's one of the issues I, I have my doubts, whether rule sets are actually um, a, a very good way to do things. I'd rather think that uh, it is a probabilistic framework, and I'm happy to discuss that later on, uh, a probabilistic framework which should be used here because rules, um, they may start to contradict each other once, once you have them. Anyway, graphical models are a way to capture, and that's graphs again, right? Similar to what we heard, what we had in the, in the uh, normalized cut segmentation. Pixels are the nodes of the graph. Pixels, in this case, if we talk about Markov random fields, are connected locally. Um, and therefore then, the edges between the pixels capture local context. And we heard, and that's one of the points I very much agree with Thomas, we heard that context is a very important issue. So Markov random fields then can be used to model local context between different areas, between different uh, spatial entities, and these entities can be pixels, they can actually be segments as well. So you can run a segmentation before that. Traditional random fields now not only capture local context, but they also capture global context. And uh, I try to visualize it uh, in the way out there. At the bottom, the axes are still the labels or the classes or those. Uh, values which need to be estimated, and the y's 
of the features. So that's the observation, that's the data. And in conditional random fields, not only one set of features is connected to one pixel, but all data are connected to all pixels. And that means, conceptually, that you're not only able to capture local, but also global context. And that's why we're using conditional random fields. They come as a sum of what's called the association potential and the interaction potential. Uh, I've given you the, the equations at the bottom, but I'm not going to go into detail into them. Suffice it to say that the sum of the A's, the association potential, basically captures the, the connection between the observations and the classes. Right? The roots should be red. As an example, in Europe many roots are red. That's part of the A's. And the I's, the interaction potential, capture the context. If one pixel is a root, and it's a large root, and it's a small pixel, the partner's going to be root too. So there is where the, where the context comes in. Right? Uh, this is all set up um, according to Bayer's theory in a, in a probability framework. So what you're trying to estimate is the conditional probabilities P there um, of X, of the labels, given the data, given the Y. Uh, and again, the estimation itself is rather involved. There's many algorithms which can do that, more and less fast, more and less involved, more and less approximate. I'm not going to uh, discuss about these. The idea here is to cast image analysis as a probabilistic question. And, and I think the conditional random fields, well, the random fields, uh, Bayer's networks, Markov random fields, conditional random fields are a good mechanism, a good tool to do that. We've extended those in order to also uh, add a temporal aspect there. So there are three components in that equation now. The third one being, okay, in epoch one, uh, it is pure soil. In epoch two, it's green vegetation. In epoch three, it's yellow um, wraps, for instance. And in epoch four, well, after harvesting, it's pure soil again. So there, there is your transition model. There is your temporal information. And if you want to do that, you can connect between different epochs. Uh, you don't have to have the same image resolution. So the graph is very bright there basically tries to visualize the fact that you can use images of different resolutions at different epochs. So that can all be captured in that, in that conditional random fields. Some results. Um, no, it's not operational. No, it's, it, this, it, it does work, however. Um, and it does give good results, I think. Um, basically, the Conditional random fields compared to ML, maximum likelihood, um, have a high accuracy, overall accuracy, and we all know this is not the end of the story if we talk about accuracy analysis, but it is on the, on the right track. And the multi-temporal um, solution uh, gives, gives even better results. If you visualize the result, you can see here, um, this is a data set containing rapid eye and eye pass data, uh, I think what's most important is that while the maximum likelihood result has this salt and pepper noise to some extent, the conditional random fields and the mono and the multi version, of course, the multi temporal version, um, are much more coherent. Now, you can expect that, because that's what the context should actually do. If there is any connection between neighboring pixels, you would expect exactly a result like that. Okay? And uh, similar if you overlay the reference, which of course was captured manually, to those three images which went into this, into this test. So, I guess I've given you a flavor of the algorithm. I, I hope I haven't, uh, haven't gone too much into the mathematics, but the keys are that local and global issues need to be captured. And that is somehow the same as saying there is different scales in all. Of course there's different scales in all, because objects have different sizes. Examples of normalized parts of the same. Discrete and analog mathematics can be good. You can have graph structures, you can have snakes going down the calculus of variation. <coughs> Road stochastics and probability. Uh, I 
like to strongly advocate these are important. Whether you use marker fields or, or conditional random fields, that perhaps a matter of choice, a matter of taste, and certainly a question of the applications. But probabilistic um, information should be in there. An optimization, how do you actually then estimate your unknown quantities? Uh, of course, comes in different, in different forms. Uh, underneath, of course, we're all looking for those semantics, and that's, that, that is still the one. Right? I guess and, uh, that can go quickly. We have, we have seen good result, a good result in the first talk. Um, as soon as the, the tasks are, are somewhat easy, and uh, I should say that the results and the algorithms and the ideas I've presented here all rely on total automatic solutions. So there's no human, human intervention here. There's no workflows, there's no, uh, no feedback. It's, it's an automatic, uh, automatic idea. Well, the idea is automatic automation. So roads and open landscape, simple buildings, vegetation, um, Else, you have to actually go into semi-automatic workflows, and we've seen an example. Research trends, I guess I've basically mentioned them before. Integration of local and global context. Context is important, and, and, and 3D goes without saying. Well, for somebody with a pedagogic background, that is it. I've talked about probabilistic frameworks. Reasons to do this are that you use data. Each of the data sets with their own accuracy characteristics, you can, you can deal with and solve conflicts, you can have inaccurate knowledge, and of course integration of different data sources is an important I've talked about object models, I've not talked about how to actually set these up. There's a whole area of research, and I'm sure you're aware of that, um, in machine learning. That's once you have these probabilistic models, there's of course three parameters which need to be trained. Now, what was called training before is called learning these days. So, terminology sometimes simply changes. But that's important. And, and then there's a few more buzzwords. Well, the temporal dimension I briefly mentioned. There's a few buzzwords I have not really gone into, such as distributed processing, scalability, sensor networks, etc. Now, um, I'm not really sure how to say it. Grateful that I can be here, and uh, I have my concerns about these names. And I have some concerns about the timelines. And I'll tell you why. When you have a problem, you usually start at the end. So I looked at the image analysis. Now, I've tried to explain to you what I understand by image analysis. It deals with what's depicted in an image. And, and I guess we all agree. I mentioned before topics like eye education, localization, etc. And I strongly advocate that there is no analysis without representation of the objects and the scene which is depicted in the images. Well, there also needs to be some information on how to transfer that information from object space to image space. Uh, so that is geometry and radiometry, reflectance. But the key thing is, of course, to represent the object. Image analysis has been around for at least 40 years. I showed you the definition by Arthur Rosenfeld in 1982. He's actually written the first book in 69. And I'm, I'm glad that we have the same reference as far as the getting none career is concerned. Uh, David Marr, of course, is very influential in the late 70s, the early 80s. And there's been a lot of research programs uh, around radius. It's one example, the image environment, the image understanding environment is another one, late 80s, early 90s. Semantic modeling, I kind of referred to that implicitly when I showed you the road extraction information. I would classify the development of the Spring Library, which actually has been taking place in Brazil, of course, at UP. And, uh, I understand the founder and the father of Spring is in the audience. Very welcome. Um, as, as, as part of that. So I'm basically saying image analysis is about objects anyway, and it's been around for a long, long time. 
If you think about this object then, um, I'm sorry, but I happen to think that this is not the best thing. Because it's a myth. And I'll tell you why. Uh, it, it, it can be misleading. Now, people have come up with knowledge-based image analysis. There's a book by uh, Professor Lietke, I think it's the late 70s, uh, in Germany, about knowledge-based image analysis. Model-based image analysis has been around in the 90s, both of which have emphasized the fact that the representation of the knowledge should be explicit, not procedural. It needs to be there anyway. But it should be explicit, such as in semantic networks, such as in frames, uh, and there's been a lot of representational frameworks around. What are these actually better terms? I don't know. Object, however, has at least two meanings. If you come from a computer science point of view, it's just an entity, and it's all fine. Could be a segment, could be a real world. There is a real world object. Um, it, it, there is confusion with, with, with object-oriented um, approaches, object-oriented pro uh, processing and programming. So, we're talking about object-based something. I guess there needs to be a definition of we what we actually mean by the object. Because in GIS, an object is something completely different. It's very clear. It's what's defined in the future catalog, and this is what we're after. And the misunderstanding is between the object as an abstract entity, such as in computer science, and the object as in the GIS world. And when you take the GIS point of view, and, and this is, of course, what we're looking for, a pixel is, of course, not the same representation as the objects. And that, therefore, then, pixels, it, it, they are the basic observations, or the gray values of the pixels, rather, in different spectral channels, etc. But it's very clear that there is something wrong with the pixels. Namely, that's not the type of representation to meaningful description, according to Rosenfeld, uh, what, what we want to see. Um, yes, objects are different in size, and therefore, of course, uh, merging pixels or sub-pixel analysis, depending on the relative size between the object and the pixel, is what we need to do. So multi-scale is inherent in there as well. And, and, and just as a reminder, if you run a segmentation, the result, of course, is segments, and not GIS objects. And that's where some of the misunderstandings comes in. Anyway, I promise you'll be provocative. Let's look at the remote sensing side of things. Um, and then, I guess, the terminology becomes a little more clear. Of course, there was a finer and finer resolution in the images. Just a few examples, such as Lancet, Spot, and Iconos, will tell you that we've, since about 10 years plus, come to a stage that, from space, the spatial extension of topographic objects matter. And that's because the pixel size is small enough such that one object is covered by multiple pixels. And therefore then, neighborhood and all the rest of it comes into, into the discussion. So the evolution, and this is in remote sensing, when you start with the classification, it's not an image analysis. The evolution from pixel-based classification to more complex schemes is very obvious in remote sensing. Uh, Multi-scale and neighborhood are starting to be important. Uh, as a side note, high resolution is always related to, to, your, to your platform. 10 centimeter pixels have been around in, in area image analysis, of course, for much longer since we started to deal with digital images. Since at the first time there were photometric scanners around uh, and they were turning the film images into digital data. So that's about 1990 when the first geometrically stable scanners came around. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned before, software tools and also hardware started to become available to, to actually be able to process all these, uh, all these uh, image data. Now for the geographic. What else, right? However, that has consequences. 
satellite image analysis, therefore then it's part of image analysis. And I tell you my view of, of image analysis. And there's good news. That means that all those algorithms out there in image analysis, computer vision, infographic, and of course the GIS relation, which I showed you earlier with respect to the model, that's all in our disposal. It's all there, it's involved partly, and again, I have to say that we have to dig into these algorithms to really understand them, because otherwise there's no way we'll understand the limits of these algorithms. We will not be able to predict where they're going to break down if we don't understand the mathematical foundation. But anyway, the probabilistic models, the semantic segmentation, uh, which some of you may find as a, as a contradiction in itself, um, but it's better to have a loop of processing or a circular process we heard earlier, rather than having separate processes which don't talk to each other in terms of what the first process committing an error and the second one not being able to recover from that error. So that's, that's why the semantic segmentation is important. 3D and time is something we've been talking about before. My view is that there is nothing special about satellite image analysis. Image analysis is a term which captures, captures this. Object-based image analysis really is a tautology. I, I checked what Shinu means in English. Uh, to me, it's like a vice shimmer. Now, shimmer means white horse, so it's a white, white horse. Um, but anyway, the good news is that there are people out there developing all these algorithms we can make use of, and we should. So we can we can come together, and this is then part of what we're what we're doing here, and we can learn from each other, and and there are great opportunities for that. If we put together the knowledge about the object, the knowledge about the algorithm, knowledge about the sensors, sometimes about the physics in between, so the atmosphere or the water or whatever may be between the sensors and the, um, and the, the, the objects. Um, yeah, there's also competition. There's large groups in computer vision who, of course, start getting interested also in the geographic field. Think about Google Maps, Google Street View, and the rest of that. But, but that's fine. I mean, we just have to acknowledge those, we have to be aware of those, we have to look into what they are doing, and then uh, basically position ourselves with respect to what's there. Yes, also with respect to what has been around in the classification world before, before ICONOS, but also with respect to what's around us right now. Thanks very much, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have.